Greetings, comrades, and welcome to the Eastern Border. I'd like to start this episode with the fact that um, you'll probably hear some more political ads on this show, since, well, previously, if you're in, if you were in Canada, then you could hear something called the PC Party advertising something on this show, because you know, I'm not a fan of the ads. I don't. I get very little money from them, but at least ACOS is polite enough to tell me that something's gonna be get advertised. So, well, right now it's going to be the NDP of Ontario, and I'm being told they're socialist? Well, for one, I'm, um, I'm not a fan of socialist parties by default, since, yeah, if they listen to my show, they'd understand. However, well, you know what? Um, if uh, a socialist party decides to advertise on this show, then that means that the socialist party hasn't really read its history books that well, and um, something fun might happen. I don't know. Maybe they're a good party. Maybe I'm misunderstanding something. All I'm saying is that I don't know anything about Canadian politics, and if you hear any advertisements about political parties, about Canada, or the United States at some point, don't blame me. ACOS is just taking them in, and um, I just get their money. In case of whatever. Because about for, for last month... We have received about $400 in advertisement revenue, which is double the amount that we got before, since we get very little advertisement money since we're Latvian, because ACOS takes the majority of it. So I just donate advertisement money to Ukrainian charities or just invest in uh, better equipment. But uh, by definition, advertisements are not our major source. Like... It, if we if we put one episode in Patreon, that already makes us and makes my you know that it it pays my bills way more. Uh, ads ads don't matter to me, and if I could, I would remove them all from the show at this point. But hey, I've signed a deal, and um, you know they they pay for our funding. But just so you knew, I am not affiliated with that party in any way or form. It's just what's happened. Now, what's really important is that um, Igor Girkin. After all this debacle in Ukraine and all this new assault in, uh, on Donetsk, has posted his new opinion, which I'll quote here in full, because that's a fun thing. But for starters, well, you, well, Russian propaganda have now turned their all attention differently. Even Ramzan Kadyrov and everyone, if every three minutes on Russian, Russian media sites, you now hear the words... Oh, previously we were just trying to be merciful to Ukraine. Right now, well now, now the real war has begun. And they literally promised that there's going to be more deaths and more destruction. Just because um, apparently they had been going soft before. And that's a nice little thing, because Russian propaganda has just decided that uh, they have to explain why they're treated somehow. And they have to tell people what's been up. But the problem is that, one, it's a lie, and they've, ju they've just been failing and mumbling their way through all of this situation. And secondly, once they fail this thing, and once they fail all their operational goals in this assault, well then, we'll hear some more news about Russian propaganda. And another thing is that um, it's been day, what, 54 of the conflict, and still NATO hasn't invaded Russia for some reason. That's your answer to everyone who says that NATO wanted to invade Russia. It, was, it is a lie, a blatant lie. Otherwise, at this point, Russia would have been invaded. Or do you consider all of NATO stupid? And once again, um, yeah, I, I've just been listening to a lot of pro-Russian shows. And, you know, when someone accuses me of lying and falsifying the facts, and I'm talking about the photos that I took on the ground there, yeah, fuck them. I, I don't. I don't have any. I don't have any polite, professional words for any of this. Um, I'm just too tired about for, for about all this situation. I just hope to bring you some interesting content and, you know, to to do my part in this whole whole conflict. However, I have to say thank you because I this was posted in in Twitter by an account called Dimitri Ninety One. Apparently, someone two years younger than I am who is a pro-Ukrainian person, but that had actually translated all this Igor Strelkov's, Igor Girkin's, as I call him, he hates the name Girkin, he just uses Strelkov, a telegram post in Twitter, and, uh, well, I have to, have to say thank you to him, 
since that really makes my job easier. And Mitri is not followed by as many people as I am, so I think it's up to me to basically make sure that uh, I spread the news and I spread the word. So, you know, without further ado, let's see now. How has this Donbass offensive gone for the Russian military? So here goes, and quoting Igor Girkin here, my uh, favorite nemesis, so to speak. Ah, oh, this is going to be a long... <clears throat> Quote, One of my comrades who came back from the front line for reorganization asked to briefly and clearly, without going into depths of warfare science, to sum up and express my thoughts that I li listed in the discussion with him, revolving around my pessimism towards the success of the second stage of this special military operation. He believes that some people might find this useful. I think that no one from those making decisions will pay any attention, but I made a promise, so here it is. In short, let's evaluate the operational situation. 1. From our side, after the successful completion of the first stage of the operation, which ended with a large-scale retreat from Kiev, Chernigov and Sumy Oblast, a relocation and concentration of the forces of the Donetsk re region of the front line has occurred. Most likely, and according to official statements of the political command of the Russian Federation, this is precisely where they are planning to conduct the second stage and complete the objective of completely clearing the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic's territory. Of the enemy's formations, that is. Sorry, just too tired. Obviously, they count on creating a... Um, two, three offensive groupings with enough manpower, which, with concentrated support of all the available aviation and the majority of artillery forces, will <clears throat> break through the Ukrainian forces, which are still for some reason not appreciated highly enough, and destroy them in one large battle. Yes, uh, the comment from me, they still see the large battle, thing that really hasn't happened since medieval era, or maybe Waterloo and, you know, some other tiny cases, but mostly it's been sieges. From the Ukrainian side, the plans of the Russian Federation's armed forces are very clear to the enemy, and they do not at all consider their defeat inevitable. Uh, it, I can attest to this. I was in Ukraine, and Ukrainian forces are with full morale, and they're fully ready to fight, and they actually consider the fact that, you know, no one in Ukraine thinks that they will lose. They are ready to give whatever comes to Russians, but... And just to keep this in reasonable lengths, I really should just continue with this one. So, they don't consider their defeat inevitable. In fact, the opposite. United Armed Forces are planning to defend their highly fortified positions, relying on old and newly created, and uh, Russian Federation gave them plenty of time for that, still quoting Girkin, positions at assumed directions of the Russian forces' strikes, which are obvious, just look at the map. Let's ask a question. Can the supremacy of Russian, uh, Russian air forces in aviation and heavy weaponry guarantee a victory over the enemy, from the, f for whom the offensive plans are obvious, who is prepared for defense, possessing a high moral spirit? My answer is no, not guaranteed at all. Why? Well, here you go. The so-called supremacy of Russian armed forces in aviation and artillery is quite relative. Since the enemy has a well-equipped and numerous military anti-aircraft capabilities, which severely limits actions on the tactical aviation, capable of supporting its own troops on the battlefield. The enemy holds an advantage in terms of field and artillery reconnaissance. UAVs of various classes on nearly squad level. Their artillery has great weaponry and excellent trained personnel. And fighting against numerous Russian armored vehicles, in defense, Ukrainians are quite capable of this due to massive amounts of anti-tank weapons among infantry, which have been provided by NATO, mind you. In conditions where Russian troops will have to storm one city agglomeration after another, numbers of, numbers of troops come to the foreground. And in this regard, neither the Russian Federation nor L LDPR have a serious advantage, unfortunately. Let's imagine that the first line of defense of the United of, of Ukrainian armed forces south of Izium and near Hulyopole is broken and our forces begin offensive in the convergent directions. Can they quickly link up in deep Ukrainian rears, creating two encirclement rings, inner and outer, with the guarantee that the enemy won't break them immediately and won't create their own salience for the advancing forces? 
Germans, apparently, did this on multiple occasions in 1942 with our forces. I doubt it. Why? Well, because for that you need a lot of detachments aimed not only for breaking through, but also for firmly establishing in the territories. You also need a large amount of supply detachments. If the enemy had innumerable forces, you could partially ignore defense or of communications. Yet, Ukrainian armed forces, thanks to mobilization, have enough forces comparable to, their own, to our own numbers. Moreover, the enemy has the ability to reduce the front line and transfer fee freed forces towards endangered directions. The Russian Federation does not have complete supremacy in the air simply due to a lack of numbers in the attack aviation and tiny numbers of attack UAVs. At the same time, the front line near Donetsk can be held by the enemy with relatively small numbers thanks to excellent engineering equipment developed over years while our genius politicians were chewing Minsk snivel. With this in mind, I presume that the general lack of forces will not allow the Russian command to conduct a deep envelopment in Dnipro region. They simply don't have enough manpower for this. So the offensive will be carried out in the shortest directions, in the north towards Slovyansk Kormatorsk, at best towards Bakarenkov, in the south on the Ukhedar Kucharovo line. Both mentioned operational lines will inevitably lead our troops to face the large, highly fortified and well-prepared defensive garrisons and numerous city agglomerations. In fact, the enemy still retains control over roads between them, which they can use to continue supplying their troops. So, after a certain time in this area, the same situation will repeat as in Severodronetsk, Papasianska, Adveyevka and Merinitskva where united forces are advancing extremely slowly and with huge losses, especially among infantry. Sorry. <clears throat> or, well, not at all, like in the Djevka. The enemy is more than happy to, with such a way to conduct their combat operations. Why? Because Ukrainians need 1.5 to 2, at best 3, months to prepare significant reserves. Not in the form of constant reinforcements into existing forces, they are, they are already happening, supporting on a very decent level the numbers of troops directly engaged in combat, but in the form of detachments that can be used in other strategic directions, while Russian forces are bleeding, storming fortified cities in Donbas. In the worst case scenario, we can repeat the situation similar to the one that happened in the Wehrmacht during the, the Operation Citadel. While Germans were slowly gnawing through the deeply reinforced defense of Soviet troops, wasting time in their sav saved reserves, Soviet command, concentrated in the north, around Belograd and Oroil, a large group of own troops not engaged in the battle. When the battle started, a counteroffensive, Germans suddenly found out that there was not enough power to simultaneously continue the operation and defend their counteroffensive of Soviet troops. The operation had to be ended and battered troops had to be returned to their original, original positions, and then more or less orderly retreat, which did not always happen for the Germans behind Dnipro. With this in mind, I would also remind you that the so-called Ukraine, and he calls it so-called Ukraine obviously, is finishing its third stage of total mobilization. They have manpower, 200-300 thousand people and equipment, a huge stream of all kinds of weapons from Europe and the United States of America, to not only support a decent number of their own troops at the front line, but also create new reserves, and create them in numbers, even 100 thousand people uh, is around 50 BTGs, including reinforcements, 300 structures, so around 10 full-bodied divisions. And uh, what about us? Here he speaks about Russia. We are conducting recruitment into various private military organizations, recruiting contractors and enlistment offices, and, uh, and that's it. LDPR, in terms of mobilization, are completely drained, and those who are still to be caught, on the streets that is, will only replenish existing and future losses. Let's say, thanks to private companies, we are able to create 10, even 20, at best, and not that, various squads and BTGs. And then... Losses taken in Donbass, storming more fortresses will result in these being very high, will need to be uh, compensated somehow. In general, how can the Russian command in 2-3 months parry, well, he calls it a parry, a concentration of fresh Ukrainian forces, for instance, at the borders of Kursk and Belgorod Oblast? And if they start an offensive, what will we have to defend them? Police? Alco Cossacks? All real Cossacks are already on the front line. Or regional militia? The regional militia has not even been created. No one is speaking about this. Or did our military arrange in advance with the enemy that they, Ukrainians, will act strictly within the plans of our Orthodox general staff? In the first stage of this special military operation, this did not seem to happen at all, with serious losses for the participants. 
I don't think the second stage will be much different. Ukrainians are definitely not planning to act as our boys for whipping. So, drawing a conclusion, I note. Without conducting at least a partial mobilization in the Russian Federation, it is impossible to conduct deep strategic advancing operations in the so-called Ukraine, as he still calls it. Fuck Girkin, man. Impossible and extremely dangerous. We need to prepare for a long and difficult war, which will require all human resources which are now uselessly wasted to have, quote, another flag over a city council. Hostimel and Butcher showed how quickly the flags can be changed. And yes, I would really like to be mistaken in my predictions for the operation that has started, the second stage. But the grand with which these hedonists that chat themselves on many occasions, these lying babblers and mediocrities, are presenting it, it's not giving me extra optimism. No conclusions have been made from the failures of the first two months. And, in a strategic sense, even more mistakes have been made. And this is coming from Igor Gerken, comrades. This is coming from the person who is extremely pro-Russian, extremely pro-Putin. Pro well, he says he's not, but de facto he is. So just so you know, pro-Russian propagandists are getting really pissed off at this war. More is going to come tomorrow. We're still working on everything. Going to keep you updated. До свидания, товарищ. And uh, happiness is mandatory. Oh, and if you can... Please support us on Patreon, the links on our Twitter page, or just click the donate button on the eastern border.lv, and of course, support Ukraine. До свидания, товарищ.